The 1990s was widely considered to be a golden age for animation, bringing cartoons back into the mainstream and giving us a treasure trove of beloved shows. But not until 1994 did we get to see our favorite web-flinging friend in action. That's right, I'm talking about none other than Spider-Man. New York's resident superhero had an action-packed series that spanned five seasons, and today we're going to be recapping it from start to finish. I know your Spidey senses are already tingling, but before we can jump in, I need to give you a little bit of context. Spider-Man the Animated Series takes place where else but in New York City. Set some time after Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man, had received his powers from a radioactive spider bite, Spider-Man may be a full-time hero, but when he's Peter Parker, he works and studies part-time, working as a photographer for the Daily Bugle, a New York newspaper outlet, and studying at Empire State University. Our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man uses his powers for the force of good and battles with with and against, an extensive cast of comic book-like characters, all with one goal in mind, to keep his friends, his family, his city, and the entire world safe. Now those are just the basics, but don't worry, we've got a lot more to learn along the way. So let's swing on into the first episode. The first episode of the series, Night of the Lizard, starts with our web-slinging hero swinging through the cityscape, where down below, a giant humanoid lizard targets two unsuspecting maintenance workers in a subway tunnel. One is able to get away, but the other is captured. The survivor, believing the creature is still chasing him, speeds away in a van. Spider-Man notices this from above and swings to the vehicle's roof, trying to get the driver to stop. The worker manages to swerve out of harm's way, but not for long, as he ends up crashing into the river. Spider-Man leaps into action and saves the worker before he plunges to a watery demise. Editor Joseph Robbie Robinson gives him an assignment to snap some pictures of a similarly mysterious lizard, just like the subway worker had seen. This is where we get our first encounter with none other than J. Jonah Jameson the editor-in-chief of the Daily Bugle and all-around hater of Spider-Man. It's a thousand dollar bonus. Uh, color or black and white? A confused Peter asks Jameson if this lizard is even real, but it's quickly shut down by both him and fellow reporter and rival Eddie Brock. Remember him for later, trust me. Jameson then hands him research on this potential monster with specialist names of people who can help, like Peter's teacher, Dr. Kurt Connors, an expert in recombinant DNA and lizard mutagenics which is a fancy way of saying man-made DNA slash mutations. Jameson then tells the two that whoever snaps the picture of the lizard first will receive $1,000 in bonuses. I mean, hey, with rent in New York, you'll need all the cash you can get. Peter heads home after accepting the job, excited and thinking of all the ways he could spend his bonus winnings on. When he finds out his loving aunt, Aunt May, is going through some financial trouble. Side note, I know many of you will know this already, but when Peter was a kid, his mom and dad were killed in a plane crash, so he ended up living with his Uncle Ben and Aunt May. And sadly, Uncle Ben was murdered before the events of the show took place. Anywho, back to the present. With his aunt's words in mind, Peter decides that if he wins the bonus, he'll give his money to her. What a good guy. Now a Spider-Man, Peter crawls into the sewer to search for the lizard. He initially believes it's an urban legend, but after stumbling on a giant footprint in sewage, a shocked Spidey snaps a picture. He takes the photo to Empire State University to show it to Dr. Kurt Connors, as if anyone can help, it'll be him. On his way to the lab, Peter is stopped by Deborah Whitman, another ESU student. As they walk into the building, a snooping Eddie Brock hears them and hides. Peter then hears a noise coming from the lab, and his spider senses go off, along with every light in the building. The two keep going, entering the darkened laboratory, where they hear Dr. Connors warning them to stay away. No, stay away! Dr. Connors? Deborah runs off to try and help him, but discovers that it isn't Kurt Connors, but instead, it's the lizard. Deborah screams for Peter's help, and the lizard jumps out of the window. Peter tries to chase after him, but Deborah begs him not to leave her alone due to the sheer fright of seeing a thing like that. That escalated quickly, huh? Peter then recalls an experiment he helped Connors with, where he injected blood from a lizard into a mouse missing one leg, promoting regrowth of its limb. And Dr. Connors promised to do the same for humans. Oh, and coincidentally, Dr. Connors is missing an arm. Not putting the pieces together, Peter wonders why anyone would want to kidnap Dr. Connors as he swings away through the city. In a different part of town, the lizard emerges from a sewer and heads home, where Dr. Connors' wife, Margaret, and son, Billy, are cooking in the kitchen. 
Margaret panics at the thought of the lizard in the shadows, but is quickly calmed as Spider-Man shows, explaining he is looking for Kurt. Outside, the lizard briefly confronts Eddie Brock, who manages to escape unharmed, and Spider-Man attempts to photograph the lizard, but accidentally drops his camera in a puddle during a scuffle. Soon after the lizard flees, Margaret confesses that the lizard is Kurt, who transformed after exposing himself to lizard DNA, just like the experiment with the mouse. Yeah, shocking, I know. Spider-Man leaves, but is forced back when he hears Margaret's cries, as Connors has returned home and kidnapped her, and her screams lead back to the sewers. Spider-Man follows the trail, finding and rescuing the missing subway worker held captive from earlier, learning that the lizard needed help building a device. The lizard plans to use a machine, operated by Margaret, to turn the city's inhabitants into lizard-like creatures. A fierce battle follows between Spidey and his scaly counterpart, inadvertently activating the Neogenic Recombinator, fancy way of saying de lizardinator and reverting the lizard back to human form. In the next episode, in the series' first two-parter, The Spider Slayer, Spider-Man is swinging through New York City when his spider senses suddenly warn him of danger, and of course, they're not wrong, as he's soon attacked by small flying robots. He manages to destroy a few, but the remaining robots corner him, but he cleverly makes two collide and explode, freeing himself and stopping any danger. Meanwhile, at Oscorp, Norman Osborn, the CEO of Oscorp, and father to Peter Parker's friend, Harry Osborn, shouts at a robotics expert, Spencer Smythe, for failing to kill Spider-Man. Spencer explains that the Spider-Seekers are meant to locate, not kill, and introduces his son, Alistair Smythe. He is the reason Spencer works for Norman, as he wants to build his son a hover chair. The two reveal the Black Widow, a giant spider-like robot built to destroy Spider-Man. Not the Russian assassin you guys may know from the movies, unfortunately. The following day at the Daily Bugle, Felicia Hardy, the daughter of a famous businesswoman, and more importantly, the real identity of... Well, we'll get to that later. Plans a charity ball with J. Jonah Jameson, requesting Peter Parker as the photographer. Back at Oscorp, Spencer finalizes the Black Widow, with the motive to rid the world of Spider-Man, as Norman considers him a dangerous criminal. They meet with Kingpin, aka Wilson Fisk, at the Chrysler Building, which is secretly the headquarters for the world's largest criminal organization, as Kingpin is the world's biggest crime lord. There seems to be a fair few character introductions in this episode. Kingpin explains that if the Black Widow fails, he gets Oscorp. Spencer then releases numerous spider seekers throughout the city to try and track down Spider-Man. At the charity ball, Peter dances with Felicia, making Flash Thompson, their friend, jealous. And in an impulsive move, Flash dons a Spider-Man costume. But the flying spider seekers outside mistake him for the real Spider-Man. Not good. The Black Widow captures the fake Spider-Man and whisks him away to Oscorp, where Kingpin's men abduct Flash, leaving Spencer behind to carry out his plan of threatening Spider-Man. As the real Spider-Man appears on the scene, he neutralizes Oscorp's security and saves Flash. A tense standoff with armed henchmen follows. Spencer activates the Black Widow, but as he does, Norman initiates a Spider-Seeker, ending in a battle which sees Spider-Man getting the better of the Black Widow, but in doing so, causes a fire to break out. Alistair's life is in jeopardy, but Norman saves him and departs, leaving Spencer in control of what's left of the Black Widow, risking his own life. Spider-Man continues to battle on, and with sheer determination and with the help of Flash, they manage to defeat the gigantic robot, causing it to plummet into a vat of acid, where it is utterly obliterated. Outside Oscorp, an enormous explosion destroys the building, taking Spencer with it. The next day, Jameson pins the blame on Eddie Brock for confusing Flash with the real Spider-Man, which costs him his job. Felicia scolds Flash for his stupid impersonation of Spider-Man, and Aunt May scolds Peter for leaving the party. In the shadows, Alistair is approached by Kingpin, who offers to finance the creation of more Spider-Slayers for the sole purpose of avenging his father's death by hunting down Spider-Man. In the second part of the two-parter, The Return of the Spider-Slayers, Peter is on a payphone talking to Aunt May about meeting Mary Jane Watson for a blind date, to which he eventually agrees to. But his spider senses alert him to danger as the Black Widow suddenly appears. Spider-Man disrupts the Black Widow circuits by using a relay tower, but their confrontation is interrupted when another spider slayer resembling a tarantula attacks. There's a whole lot of spiders here, huh? Back at Crime Central, 
Alistair Smythe, now in a new hover chair, informs Kingpin about their plan and emphasizes the importance of killing Spider-Man. Meanwhile, Spider-Man continues to battle the Spider Slayers, with the Black Widow descending to street level, where a little girl and her mother become involved in the action, leading Spider-Man to protect them. As the Tarantula freezes him with a freeze ray, the Black Widow captures him with grapple hooks, but Spider-Man manages to place a spider tracer on her. The Spider Slayers take the unconscious Spider-Man to Crime Central, where he is placed on a table and restrained. Mr. Jameson, I have something that might interest you. Smythe lures J. Jonah Jameson to the scene, where both are captured and handcuffed to a bomb set to explode in one hour. Smythe then reveals through his monologuing that he blames Spider-Man, Jameson, Norman Osborn, Flash Thompson, and Eddie Brock for his father's death. Spider-Man and Jameson are dropped off on a rooftop, far from Crime Central, so with only one hour left, they rush to save the others Smythe plans to kill, like Flash, arriving just in time to save him. Jameson calls Norman Osborn to warn him about the Spider Slayers, but Osborn seems confident that Oscorp's security can handle the situation. Meanwhile, Eddie Brock tries to secure a job at another newspaper, and the editor initially refuses due to Jameson's warnings. However, Brock persuades him to hire him. The Tarantula arrives, causing chaos, firing a laser at Brock, but he manages to evade it. As Brock runs from the Tarantula, Spider-Man arrives and saves him, though Brock doesn't express much gratitude. A battle ensues between Spider-Man and the Tarantula, leading Spider-Man to outsmart the robotic villain, but not before he gets Eddie fired. Back at Crime Central, Smythe completes the Scorpion, his final Spider Slayer, and sends it to New York City to kill Spider-Man. Oscorp's drone tanks engage the Scorpion upon its arrival, but the Scorpion easily overpowers them. Spider-Man appears, hearing the laser blast, and realizes he has mere seconds to stop the Scorpion before the bomb on his wrist explodes. From inside Oscorp, Osborn orders security to launch the Heladrones. The Black Widow, Tarantula, and Tri-Spider Slayer arrive at Oscorp, combining to form a giant Spider Slayer. With the bomb's timer ticking, Spider-Man rushes to save Osborn, but he escapes in his car before the Tri-Spider Slayer's deadly assault on him. Spider-Man heads to Washington Bridge for a final showdown with the Slayer, and figures that his bomb is the best way to deal with the mechanical menace. So, he attaches the bomb to the Slayer and leaps away as it's blown to Kingdom Come, falling to its death in the river. Watching from Crime Central, Kingpin reminds Smythe of their deal, and Smythe vows to work for him until Spider-Man is dead, even if he's failed this time. Later that night, Peter Parker is at home sewing up his torn Spider-Man costume when Aunt May informs him about his date with Mary Jane. Though he had forgotten about this blind date, Peter becomes pleasantly surprised when he answers the door and finds Mary Jane to be a beautiful redhead. We've already had a two-parter this season, but we're about to be treated to a three-parter. And trust me, this story needs all three. We're looking at a trilogy of episodes called The Alien Costume, with the first part starting on an asteroid in space, where astronaut and son of Mr. Jameson, John Jameson, discovers a peculiar black rock and begins extracting it. As the rock is unearthed, a sinister black liquid oozes to the surface, causing seismic disturbance. John manages to make it back to the shuttle just in time, narrowly escaping being consumed by the alien substance. Back on Earth, J. Jonah Jameson and the Daily Bugle staff tune into a news report on John Jameson's imminent return to Kennedy Airport. Peter Parker offers his congratulations, but Jameson dismisses the praise, stating that John is merely living up to his legacy. He is a Jameson, after all. The news report mentions that the astronauts are bringing a new isotope, Prometheum X, which could be more potent than plutonium. Over at Crime Central, Kingpin takes a keen interest in acquiring this rare substance. But back on the shuttle, John and his colleague Paul Stevenson commence their re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, where the Prometheum X undergoes a transformation. A bubbling black substance with an undercurrent of evil infiltrates the shuttle's cockpit, while a live video feed shows the astronauts giving the public a perfect view of Stevenson slowly being engulfed by the Black Ooze, which causes him to lose control of the shuttle. 
The descent could spell disaster for New York City, prompting Peter to call Aunt May and instruct her to seek shelter in the basement, whilst Kingpin orders Alistair Smythe to evacuate Crime Central, fearing that the shuttle's impending crash could jeopardize the facility. However, Smythe suggests that the shuttle's trajectory might lead it to the George Washington Bridge instead. In response, Kingpin immediately contacts his enforcer, Rhino, a villain with unparalleled strength who wears a rhino suit that is bonded to his body. Kingpin and instructs him to intercept the Prometheum X on the bridge, and off he goes. J. Jonah Jameson rushes to the scene in a helicopter, against Robbie's advice, only to find that air traffic has been restricted, while down below, Eddie Brock pays no attention to warnings and decides to photograph the impending disaster. As the shuttle approaches the bridge, Peter confronts Rhino, now in his Spider-Man suit. The shuttle comes to a halt on the bridge, narrowly avoiding a catastrophic collision. Peter enters the shuttle to check on the astronauts, where inside, he finds Stevenson missing. But before he can investigate further, Rhino charges at him. A fierce battle unfolds, with Spider-Man narrowly preventing the shuttle from plunging into the Hudson River. However, he is incapacitated by Rhino. And as Rhino departs, Spider-Man secretly attaches a spider tracer to him. Eddie Brock captures images of Rhino's feats of strength and agility, unaware of the impending disaster inside the shuttle. Aboard the helicopter, a weakened John Jameson mentions a black tar-like substance, the bridge, and Spider-Man, leading J. Jonah Jameson to wrongly conclude that Spider-Man is responsible for the crash. Classic JJ. Eddie Brock approaches Jameson, claiming to possess photographic evidence of Spider-Man's involvement and demanding his job at the Daily Bugle back. Jameson sees this as an opportunity to discredit Spider-Man, and of course, he accepts. When Spider-Man emerges from the Hudson River, he discovers some mysterious black slime on his costume. But not worried, he jumps into action and swings through the city to track down Rhino. But his GPS is drawing a blank. Rhino is back at Crime Central, delivering the Prometheum X to Kingpin, who gladly accepts his rare prize, an unbelievably strong nuclear fuel. Peter, on the other hand, is upset that everyone always blames Spider-Man, as he throws his costume into the closet and goes to sleep. During his sleep, the black goo grows, crawling on his costume, and then on him. Peter has a dream where he fights and gets eaten by a black blob, only to wake up upside down from a building in his new black costume, and quickly realizes he has an assortment of new powers. He's stronger, faster, and his body moves by itself. Sweet! I, I see this as an absolute win. No way this has any unintended side effects, right? Uh, right? Back at home, Aunt May expresses her concerns about Peter continuing to photograph Spider-Man because everyone is hunting him thanks to Jameson, as she fears for his safety. How dangerous that! I'm not gonna listen to any more of this. The discussion soon becomes heated, leading Peter to storm off to his room, where his GPS suddenly activates, picking up the spider tracer, and more importantly, Rhino signal. Spider-Man locates Rhino as he storms a military facility to acquire the Lydium-90 control rods on the behalf of Kingpin and Smythe. A fierce clash ensues, with Spider-Man initially struggling against Rhino's formidable power, but Spider-Man manages to subdue Rhino, who refuses to divulge Kingpin's identity out of fear for his life. In a moment of rage, Spider-Man nearly crushes Rhino with a heavy door, but reconsiders at the last moment and leaves him unharmed. Back in the city, Spider-Man realizes the overwhelming darkness within himself and sees his reflection as a monstrous entity. Following straight on into the alien costume part two, three police helicopters close in, and Spider-Man finds himself under attack from multiple assailants, all eager to claim the one million dollar bounty on him. Thankfully, his black suit springs into action, enabling his escape from this dangerous situation. Over at the Daily Bugle, J. Jonah Jameson discusses the stolen Prometheum X with Eddie Brock, but Spider-Man's sudden appearance disrupts the conversation. He informs Jameson that it was Rhino who stole the Prometheum X, insisting that Jameson call off the bounty on Spidey's head. Seeking answers, Spider-Man turns to Dr. Kurt Connors, who identifies the black suit as an alien symbiote and warns Spider-Man to rid himself of it. Spider-Man sneaks into Brock's apartment and looks for the film of the Rhino. He eventually finds the film in the shower head in his bathroom and swears that Brock will learn a lesson for lying to Jameson and tarnishing his reputation. As Spider-Man enters the living room, he can hear someone talking to Brock. The man introduces himself
himself to Brock as Shocker and demands to know where the pictures of the shuttle crash site are before unleashing his sonic gauntlets at Brock. But Spidey intervenes, chasing Shocker back to Kingpin's lair, where he snatches the Prometheum X out of Smythe's grasp and flees back to his home to study it. Alistair, Smythe, and Shocker get back to Crime Central and tell Kingpin that Spider-Man has taken the Prometheum X. Kingpin says that they must get it back, even if they have to threaten the whole city. So with Kingpin's words in mind, Shocker breaks into John Jameson's hospital room and takes him then breaks into J. Jonah Jameson's house, shows him his son's hospital bracelet, and tells him to listen very carefully. Jameson goes on TV from his home, asking Spider-Man for help, and saying it's a life or death matter after being manipulated by Shocker to contact Spider-Man. Peter watches the broadcast and is annoyed that Jameson, who had once put a price on his head, now suddenly wants his help, but the thought of something happening to John lights a fire in Peter, who gets ready to meet his boss, as Spider-Man. As Jameson walks to his car, Spider-Man confronts him, expressing his frustration at having to fix Jameson's problems, especially after the trouble he's caused him. Eddie Brock watches Spider-Man and Jameson head to an old church from a distance and begin to follow them, thinking that the pair are working against him. Getting a little complicated here, but it'll all pay off, I swear. Inside, they meet Smythe, who demands the Prometheum X, but Spider-Man wants to see John Jameson first. And after checking John is safe, Spider-Man hands over the prized nuclear fuel. But of course, Smythe double-crosses Spider-Man by bringing Shocker, who activates his gauntlets and fires them at Spider-Man. But he dodges Shocker's blasts. He uses a shield to deflect Shocker's attacks, causing a mess. Spider-Man frees himself and tries to confront Shocker, but Shocker blasts through the wall and makes his escape. But Spider-Man won't let him go this easy as he heads to the bell tower to deal with him once and for all. Also, this clip is born. Peter's going a little overboard if you can't tell. Spider-Man and Shocker fight, but Eddie Brock intervenes, causing Spider-Man to let Shocker go. Spider-Man webs up Eddie and then smashes Shocker's gauntlets with a stone railing. He holds Shocker near the edge of the bell tower, ready to drop him, but Shocker pleads, and his words spark a memory in Spider-Man of his Uncle Ben, whose words about power and responsibility echo throughout his mind. But the symbiote-infused suit acts on his behalf and drops Shocker. Peter then quickly takes control and fires a web line to Shocker, saving him from certain death. A furious Spider-Man tries to get the black suit off, but can't, as the goo-like substance feels almost bonded to him. But just then, the church bell rings, causing Spidey to writhe in agony. Peter realizes that the suit doesn't like loud sounds, so he goes closer to the bell, and with one more gong, the suit separates from him. It tries to reattach, but Peter fights back. It grabs his arm and throws him him over the edge, but he holds onto a railing and watches the suit disappear through a crack in the floor. Back in Kingpin's lab, Smythe brings the Prometheum X, but it's turned into something else, so is no longer useful. Meanwhile, the symbiotic solution finds its way onto none other than Eddie Brock. It warps him. He gets a new voice and visually striking strong muscles. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is the very first appearance of the sinister symbiote, Venom. Venom breaks free from Spider-Man's web and sees a newspaper with a picture of Spider-Man. And with both Eddie and Venom wanting revenge on our hero, it's not hard to see what's going to happen next. You know the drill by now. We go straight into the third and final part, where, in his new place, Eddie Brock is surrounded by images of his nemesis Spider-Man, fueling an intense workout as memories of his humiliations at Spider-Man's hands flood back he clinches a photo, vowing vengeance. It's in this moment that the malevolent black symbiote envelops Brock, melding with his anger, and he christens himself for the very first time in the series as Venom. Venom. Meanwhile, Spider-Man, back in his classic red costume, swings through the city, eager to meet Mary Jane Watson for a date. However, he spots Rhino on a rooftop, and upon landing, Spider-Man battles Rhino, deftly trapping him by encircling Rhino's horn with metal poles. But a surprise interruption by Shocker complicates things. Shocker's vibrating gauntlet sends Spider-Man crashing into a Daily Bugle billboard, temporarily knocking him out, and amidst the chaos, Venom appears seizing Rhino by the horn and spinning him around. All that work in the gym must have really paid off. 
Or maybe it's just a symbiote. As Shocker attempts to stop Venom with his sonic attack, Venom skillfully outmaneuvers him and captures him. Spider-Man finally frees himself and discovers Shocker and Rhino entangled in strange webs. When Eddie Brock appears, startling Spider-Man by addressing him as Peter Parker, revealing his knowledge of Spidey's secret identity, the symbiote then transforms Brock into Venom, who tosses Spider-Man aside. Spider-Man and Venom lock in combat, while Spider-Man attempts to reason with the increasingly unstable Venom, but to no avail, as the symbiote captures him in his stronger web and once again tosses Spidey away and flees. Spider-Man's pursuit to locate Venom leads him to Brock's old apartment in search of any hints he can find. After a phone call to Atlas Equipment, Peter discovers a vital lead. At the Daily Bugle, he stumbles upon an article about the NASA satellite launch in John Jameson's honor, named the John Jameson Probe. Haunted by the idea of Venom exposing his identity, Spider-Man finds himself in a perilous showdown as the symbiote appears and threatens Spider-Man, shooting his webs towards him. Spider-Man is trapped in the strong spider web, and Venom unmasks him, exposing his true identity high from a skyscraper. Check it out, dude. His mask is off. His mask falls to the ground, and Jameson grabs a camera to focus in on a dangling Spider-Man. But he cuts his way out of Venom's grasp and grabs a flag, using it as a makeshift mask and flees the scene. He heads towards Mary Jane, who he had a planned date with at the theater, but it seems Eddie Brock made his way to her first. Peter drags MJ away from him and towards the subway, but Brock's ominous presence looms as he heads home to find Brock waiting for him at his front door. Spider-Man and Venom engage in another battle, resulting in a heart-pounding chase across the city. Spider-Man ingeniously outwits Venom, causing him to crash an 18-wheeler, only to recover and continue the pursuit on a subway. The chase takes a perilous turn as it leads to a military rocket launch site where Spider-Man barely escapes Venom's clutches. He follows Spider-Man onto a space shuttle as an impending shuttle launch provides the backdrop for their high stakes battle. Venom continues in a relentless pursuit, but the roaring shuttle engine disrupts the symbiote, rendering it vulnerable. The shuttle carries Venom into space, severing his connection with Eddie Brock who is subsequently arrested. In the aftermath, Mary Jane and Peter, under the night sky, share a moment of contemplation about the mysteries of space. And amidst the stars, Peter catches one last glimpse of the haunting memory of Venom. The first episode of the second season, titled The Insidious Six, starts with Spider-Man perched high atop a towering skyscraper as he gazes out over the hustling and bustling city of New York. He thinks about the intricate web of connections that binds its citizens together, and how everyone has a special someone or a real best friend. And Spidey's only friend is Bruce, a gargoyle. He wishes for a real connection, with someone as captivating as Felicia Hardy or Mary Jane Watson, but then figures that a guy who spends his nights crawling up walls isn't the ideal partner. As he clings to the side of a nearby building, out of nowhere, his extraordinary powers suddenly waver, sending him into an unexpected freefall. He manages to slow his fall down, but that doesn't stop him from landing in a big vat of chicken feathers. I mean, at least they broke his fall. When night falls, the criminal masterminds of New York assemble in secret, led by the imposing Kingpin. Kingpin boasts of their recent criminal triumphs, but tensions simmer beneath the surface, and a rival crime lord, Silvermane, takes advantage of the situation and springs a cunning trap, ensnaring Kingpin in a web of wires. Silvermane scolds Kingpin for his diminishing influence and respect within the crime cartel, but Kingpin swiftly breaks free, calling out his adversary's hammerhead and owl, and tells the criminal coven of his bold plan to eliminate their shared enemy, Spider-Man. Of course that's the plan. That's always the plan. Meanwhile, a small robot infiltrates a prison, ultimately leading to the liberation of the Chameleon, an international hitman with the elusive ability to shapeshift into anyone and even copy their voices. Chameleon was imprisoned in an earlier episode by the Supreme Headquarters of International Espionage Law Enforcement Division, or otherwise known as S.H.I.E.L.D., for his crimes against New York City. So now, jail-free and fitted with an image inducer and a communication device courtesy of Alistair Smythe, Chameleon adopts the guise of a prison guard, facilitating the escape of the Scorpion, Mysterio, and Shocker, 
We've met Shocker before, but the Scorpion and Mysterio are other supervillains of great strength and special abilities. In the past, Mysterio especially was a huge thorn in the side of our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. After securing their costumes and equipment, the group reconverges with Mysterio, who conjures a smokescreen to cloak their getaway. They go and recruit one more member, Dr. Otto Octavius or Dr. Octopus as he's known in the criminal world, a formerly great scientist whose rogue experiment went wrong, fusing mechanical arms to his nervous system that now semi-control him. The villains meet at an abandoned warehouse, the place of all great villain meetups, where Kingpin formally recruits them into a formidable collective known as the Insidious Six, where he tells them about his plan to rid of Spider-Man, having them face decoy versions of their arachnid adversary. The ensuing night sees Spider-Man relentlessly scouring the city in pursuit of these escaped criminals until morning, but his powers continue to fluctuate unpredictably, leaving him to once again lose his footing and fall vulnerable to attack by any of his famous foes. Peter then rushes to the Empire State University for a class, but arrives late, and everything is finishing up. As he leaves, he notices Rhino causing trouble in town, so he dons his costume and goes to grapple with him, when he runs into some members of the Insidious Six, who ambush him. It's a showdown, as Spider-Man faces off against Rhino, Scorpion, Shocker, and Chameleon. The odds seem stacked against him, but a sudden appearance of Mysterio makes things worse. And if you thought that was tough, well, just then, Dr. Octopus joins the fray. Back off, you pea-brained- Spider-Man fades into obscurity now as Peter Parker in the subway, escaping the six grasp. Peter needs answers on why he's losing his powers, so he turns to Dr. Connors to see if he has any idea of what's going on. Connor runs tests on his DNA, and the first tests come back. It isn't good news. Connor tells Peter that his DNA is reverting, and it may forever have changed back to its original state, meaning his powers may have been lost forever. Meanwhile, back at Crime Central, Kingpin relays a message to the frustrated Six to track down Spider-Man at any cost. The Six figure that Peter Parker, who to them is Spider-Man's resident photographer, must know something about the whereabouts of the wall-crawling worm, so they decide to kidnap Aunt May under the guise of Peter being found ill at Doc Ock's clinic. As Peter returns home, he notices that Aunt May is missing. Concerned, he searches the house, but can't find her, but does find a note revealing that his aunt has been abducted and instructing him to direct Spider-Man to 636 Battery Street immediately if he wishes to save her. Realizing that he cannot fail his beloved Aunt May, Peter, despite his wavering powers, dons his Spider-Man costume and heads to the location given by the kidnappers. Upon his arrival, Spider-Man falls into a trap door, which leads him into the clinic's basement. As he tries to approach Aunt May, Mysterio emerges from a smokescreen, and other members of the Insidious Six, Dr. Octopus, Rhino, Shocker, and Scorpion appear, surrounding him. In a surprising twist, Aunt May reveals herself to be the Chameleon, who metamorphizes into a menacing figure and ominously questions Spider-Man about his readiness to face the end. Swinging on into the second part of this villainous two-parter, Aunt May, who's still held hostage, anxiously awaits news on Peter's condition at the clinic. Chameleon, disguised as a nurse, enters the waiting room. He reassures May that Peter is receiving good treatment from Dr. Otto Octavius and his staff, despite his serious condition. In the clinic's basement, Spider-Man battles the overpowering Insidious Six. Shocker fires a blast at him with his Vibroshock gauntlets, narrowly dodged by Spider-Man. Then Doc Ock follows as he attempts to capture Spider-Man with his mechanical arms, and a chaotic scene unfolds when Mysterio's hollow cubes spill out, projecting a jungle illusion. Spider-Man, lurking within the holographic jungle, eludes Doc Ock, who remains unaware of Spider-Man's loss of powers. Then Spidey evades capture by Rhino and Scorpion, but ultimately falls into the clutches of Doc Ock, leading to his capture. Meanwhile, at Crime Central, Kingpin commends the Insidious Six for apprehending Spider-Man. In a video call, Silvermane informs Kingpin that the cartel mandates action due to the failure to eliminate Spider-Man, but he quickly shows his old rival footage of the captured Spider-Man. 
Kingpin reveals that he pursued Spider-Man because he is his personal adversary. He instructs Dr. Octopus to unveil Spider-Man's identity, and a startling revelation occurs when Spider-Man is unmasked as Peter Parker. Although Mysterio suggests killing him, I say we destroy him now! Dr. Octopus argues that Peter cannot be the real Spider-Man, given the ease of his capture. Rhino deduces that Peter impersonated Spider-Man out of desperation to locate the genuine article. As Shocker attempts to attack Peter, a mishap occurs, sending him crashing into a chair. Peter seizes a holocube, prompting Dr. Octopus to make a deal. Peter must lead them to the real Spider-Man to secure Aunt May's safety. Silvermane observes the situation and criticizes Kingpin for abducting an elderly woman and instructs Hammerhead to attack him. An order Kingpin anticipates, but counters by ordering the Insidious Six to attack the cartel first. Peter goes with the plan and pretends to be a patient to make the Six's story to Aunt May work, sending her home while he stays to lead the Six to Spider-Man. Back over with the Crime Lords, Hammerhead informs Silvermane of Kingpin's impending attack. Kingpin's helicopter, carrying Rhino, crashes into the building, allowing Shocker and Scorpion to infiltrate Silvermane's lair. In an elevator, Hammerhead reveals himself to be Chameleon. On the roof, Chameleon switches appearances with Silvermane and convinces one of Silvermane's henchmen to abort the attack on Crime Central. Peter and the Insidious Six meet on a hotel roof, where Peter claims to rendezvous with Spider-Man. Peter triggers a holocube, projecting a fighter jet illusion, creating confusion and enabling his escape. He throws another holocube, creating a canyon illusion to deceive Rhino, and near the rooftop's edge, Peter alerts the others and provokes Shocker to attack him, proving his powers have returned. With renewed agility, he swings back to the rooftop. Kingpin and Silvermane observe the standoff from their helicopter, before Kingpin throws Silvermane to his demise. Spider-Man saves the criminal, though, and swings off with him. Kingpin orders the Insidious Six to search for the two as Spider-Man questions Silvermane, who claims he was targeted for ransom due to his wealth, then instructs him to hide. When Dr. Octopus and Scorpion spot them, Spider-Man's powers begin to wane once more. As they exit the building, Doc Ock catches sight of them and instructs Shocker to pursue, but Spider-Man tosses Shocker into a water tower, creating an explosion. Spider-Man swings over to another building with Silvermane, then disposes of Dr. Octopus and Scorpion. However, his powers once again start to diminish. Spider-Man and Silvermane swing to a nearby building, where Spider-Man lowers Silvermane into a chimney before his powers completely vanish. Dr. Octopus and Scorpion confront him, but with his agility, Spider-Man evades their attacks. Reaching the ground, Spider-Man finds Silvermane in the company of children who mistook him for Santa Claus. Silvermane thanks Spider-Man for saving him from ransom and gaining him public favor. As Silvermane departs, he informs crime lords that Kingpin is a menace to New York and must be eliminated as Spider-Man retrieves his clothes and heads home. Later, the Insidious Six reconvene in an alley, expressing their discontent with Kingpin's failed promise to eliminate Spider-Man. Ignoring Kingpin's attempts to maintain their alliance, they discard their headsets and part ways. At Crime Central, Smythe warns Kingpin that Silvermane will rally other crime lords against him. However, Kingpin remains determined to confront Silvermane. Peter returns home, where Aunt May is relieved to see him. Afterwards, he heads to the ESU to tell Connor that he suddenly started feeling great and to forget the tests on him. But Connors tells him that the tests have been completed and that his DNA isn't reverting, it's mutating. And whatever Peter is mutating into, it won't be human. Now we're looking at the episode Morbius. Yep, that Morbius. It starts with Spider-Man swinging through the busy streets of New York City, and obviously, he can't help but think about a possible cure for his inevitable mutation. The thought of his friend and doctor Mariah Crawford gives him hope, as she may be the only person able to help him. Then suddenly, an alarm blares from a pawn shop, and Spider-Man springs into action, chasing the thieves who speed away in their car. He catches up to them, leaps onto the car's roof, and opens the sunroof, grabbing one of the criminals. However, a sudden sharp pain in his side grabs his attention. He watches as the car veers towards an oncoming truck, leading to a collision that sends him tumbling to the ground. The crook sees the moment, but luckily the police arrive, saving Spider-Man and allowing him to slip away. The next day at the Hardy Foundation, Spider-Man shares his constant side pain with Dr. Crawford, and as he hoped, Mariah offers a potential cure, though she warns about the risks. 
With some reluctance, she hands him a serum that could either strip him of his powers, or worse, prove fatal. That night, at Empire State University, we see Michael Morbius, a fellow student of Peter's works on his Neogenics project. Over in the lab, Peter contemplates testing the serum on his own blood sample, which he secures in a locker. This way, he wouldn't face any adverse side effects and would know if it worked. A sudden noise distracts him and brings another bout of side pain, so he leaves, accidentally leaving his blood sample behind. Morbius enters the lab, finds Peter's blood sample, and is fascinated by it, beginning to observe it. In a different part of the university, Felicia Hardy explores the attic, where she crosses paths with her secret lover Morbius, and he reveals his secret neogenics project and his mission to cure a devastating disease affecting his hometown in Europe. Later that evening, Peter grapples with the fear of mutation, wanting to call Mary Jane but fearing she'd be getting involved with a monster. In the ESU attic, Morbius intensifies his experiments, eager to unlock the secrets of Peter's neogenic blood sample, so exposes the blood to a neogenic recombinator's beam. Inconveniently though, a vampire bat disrupts the experiment, biting Morbius and causing him to pass out. Morbius wakes up, feeling stronger after the bat's bite, now discovering he can fly, but when he sees his reflection, he's horrified by his changed appearance. A sinister hunger begins to gnaw at him, and he takes to the skies. As Spider-Man contemplates his powers, Morbius, still wrestling with his newfound vampiric nature, seeks blood. And as repulsive as it was, Spider-Man finds a forgotten tape recorder, revealing that the vampire is none other than his old colleague, Michael Morbius. Tormented by guilt over Morbius's transformation, Spider-Man vows to find a cure and tracks Morbius to ESU. A confrontation erupts when Morbius tries to attack a student. As they fight, Spider-Man endures the pain and promises to help. He then scours the campus for Morbius. Upon reaching Felicia's apartment, Peter warns her about the danger Morbius poses. She misunderstands, thinking it's just jealousy, and invites Morbius inside. To her horror, he transforms into a vampire. Spider-Man hears her screams and rushes to help. He intervenes, urging Morbius to seek help, but Morbius flies away, weakened from abstaining from blood. The chase leads them back to ESU, where they fight on a rooftop. Morbius tries to drain Spider-Man's blood, but flies past him, struggling with his morality, only to stumble and fall off the rooftop where Spider-Man fires a web to save him. But with the rising sun, Michael reverts back to human form, leaving him weak, where passerby comes to his aid. The next night, as darkness falls, Felicia visits Morbius in the hospital, unaware that she has mere minutes before he transforms into his vampiric state. Morbius has already fled his room and watches Felicia enter from a distance. The police investigate Morbius' disappearance, with suspicion falling on Spider-Man. Mariah contacts Sergei Kravinov, aka Kraven the Hunter, and shares her feelings that the serum may do something even worse than kill Spider-Man. The police launch a search for the wall crawler, but no one will be able to recognize him, as Mariah's serum inadvertently accelerates Peter's mutation, causing excruciating pain as he grows four extra arms, changing his genetic makeup forever. The next episode, titled Enter the Punisher, begins as Aunt May hears a noise from Peter's room, so she decides to go up and investigate. However, though she finds no sign of her nephew, she does find one of his shirts and sees four holes torn on each side. As she approaches the window, a shadow startles her, but she decides it's nothing to worry about and returns downstairs. Meanwhile, at an abandoned warehouse, three thugs hold a woman hostage, demanding a million dollars from her wealthy father. An explosion tears a hole in the wall, and a man with a skull on his chest rushes in, swiftly dispatching two of the thugs. The last thug tries to shoot his gun, but is overpowered. The vigilante frees the woman, speeds to his van, and drives off. His ally, Microchip, informs him of a new target, Spider-Man. What do you know? I was wondering when he and I would tangle. Yep, that's right. This is the Punisher, a vigilante on the side of good, with his best friend Microchip who invents all of his weaponry. Back at the Parker residence, Peter examines his four extra arms in the mirror. Regretting not heeding Mariah Crawford's advice about delaying the serum, he modifies his Spider-Man costume, cutting holes for his additional limbs. Mary Jane calls, but he declines her invitation to a movie due to his... 
uh, condition, leading to an argument. I mean, can you imagine how that date would go? Mary Jane threatens to visit, but Peter hangs up, dons his mask, and swings into New York City. In an alley behind an Italian restaurant, a worker takes out the trash and is attacked by Morbius, who drains his blood. Spider-Man arrives at the Hardy Foundation, surprising Dr. Crawford with his four extra arms. And as the side pain returns, Mariah takes a blood sample and informs him about Morbius. Mariah turns on the TV, and Spider-Man watches a news report on Morbius' hospital disappearance. Felicia Hardy accuses Spider-Man of harming Morbius, while J. Jonah Jameson demands his capture. Meanwhile, Punisher and Microchip watch the broadcast and agree to bring Spider-Man in alive, using non-lethal weapons. Your windows! Barricade your doors! As Spider-Man continues watching, the news reports his arrival at the crime scene, but it's actually Morbius. And so, despite Dr. Crawford's warnings, Spider-Man goes after him. A rooftop showdown ensues, with Morbius questioning Spider-Man's extra arms. Because, I mean, yeah, who wouldn't? And they clash. Morbius tosses Spider-Man at a building, but he narrowly avoids impact by clinging to the wall, and attempting to shoot a web, he raises a new arm without a web shooter, giving Morbius an opening. But as Spider-Man swings away, he's spotted by Punisher, who pursues him with a jetpack. <laughs> yeah, a freaking jetpack! Punisher fires an energy weapon, trapping Spidey in a force field, but he manages to disarm him with a web line and escapes. Not without Punisher attaching a tracking device to him, though. The battle van fires a flare, and slippery liquid forces Spider-Man to the ground. Punisher aims his missile launcher, but it hits Spider-Man's web, allowing Punisher to capture him in a net. Meanwhile, Joseph Robertson calls J. Jonah Jameson and reveals that the Punisher is wanted for questioning by the FBI and CIA regarding the disappearance of crime figures. Jameson believes they can turn Punisher into a hero, but Robbie objects, stating that he fires a gun first and asks questions later. As the Punisher attempts to pull Spider-Man up, the web-slinger breaks free and tries to swing away, but Punisher immobilizes him with adhesive, accusing him of abducting Morbius. Spider-Man denies responsibility, breaks free, and pins Punisher to a building before fleeing leaving the police to surround Punisher. However, Punisher uses a remote to cut the web and escapes. Spider-Man arrives at the hospital, overhearing doctors discussing a victim with significant blood loss and realizing Morbius is still in the city, Spidey decides to confront him, despite his constant side pain. He knows he needs Dr. Crawford's help, but remembers the consequences of prioritizing himself in the past. Spider-Man is determined to find Morbius, using a tape recorder as his lead. He returns home and skulks to his room through the window, listens to the tape, and pinpoints the source of the sounds. It seems like things are finally calming down a bit for Peter. Let's take a moment to relax our minds. <sighs> oh shoot, I spoke way too soon! Remember how our skull donning friend put a tracker on old Pete earlier? Well, the Punisher follows Spidey as he uses the recording to track Morbius down. The vampiric villain is found in a clock tower, and upon finding him, Spider-Man offers to take him to get help, but Morbius resists, to put it lightly. During their fight, Spider-Man pushes Morbius into a neogenic recombinator that Morbius was building to cure himself. Morbius reveals his struggle with a hunger for blood, and Spider-Man, facing an attack, shoots Webb into Morbius's face, causing him to retreat. As Morbius flies away into the night, Punisher arrives and fires an RPG at Spider-Man, who narrowly avoids the blast. Punisher chases him, firing another RPG, causing Spider-Man to crash through a warehouse roof. Punisher enters the warehouse, where Spidey's mutation accelerates, transforming him into a creepy humanoid spider, which towers over a petrified Punisher. I mean, can you blame him? At least this fits with what he wanted to be called in the first live-action movie, right? Eh, uh, maybe not. The episode Duel of the Hunters picks up where the last episode left off, inside a warehouse as the Punisher retreats from the transformed Spider-Man as it spews acid. I'm going with it at this point. The acid splatters Punisher's jacket, leading him to discard it and draw a gun. But the mutated Spider-Man swiftly disarms and overpowers him, hurling him across the room. The Punisher finds Spider-Man's mask and picks it up amidst acid getting fired at him as the monster approaches. The acid strikes a chemical container, causing a fire. And as Punisher attempts to flee, the mutant ensnares him in webbing and drags 
drags him closer. Thankfully, the battle van, remotely controlled by Punisher, arrives and allows him to escape. Spider-Man tries to tear into the van, but it speeds away, knocking him off. He crashes through a warehouse wall, swings away, and terrifies a construction worker. As the battle van speeds off, Punisher frees himself from Spider-Man's webbing and microchip checks on him. Punisher assures he's fine and drives off whilst firefighters arrive at the warehouse to extinguish the blaze. The police question a man who witnessed the creature and Terry Lee takes a drawing of it. She instructs them to issue an APB, an All Points Bulletin, to warn New York's residents about this newly formed Spider-Man. This seems straight out of a horror movie. At the Hardy Foundation, Mariah Crawford learns of Spider-Man's transformation into a monster and contacts Sergei Kravinov, urging him to come to New York City. Punisher gears up to confront Spider-Man, now known as Man-Spider. Eh, makes sense. Microchip raises concerns, but Punisher insists on hunting monsters, especially one like this. He expects Man-Spider to hide during the day, and as dawn breaks, just as the Punisher predicts, Man-Spider crawls into the subway to rest. At the Parker house, May accidentally wakes up Mary Jane, and the two decide to visit the police together because Spider-Man hasn't returned home. With the threat in the city, they're scared for his safety and wonder if Spider-Man is involved. Meanwhile, Mariah meets Sergei at the airport, where she shares the cure she developed for Spider-Man, and as night falls, back over at the Punisher's headquarters, he prepares to confront Man-Spider. Kravinov joins Mariah to track down Spider-Man while our ghoulish vampire foe, Morbius, observes Felicia Hardy from a nearby building, resisting his bloodlust and realizing he needs to cure himself. Man-Spider arrives at Empire State University and recalls his human memories, but his screams alarm Deborah Whitman, who runs for help but gets dismissed by Flash, who says she's just paranoid. Does Flash watch the news at all? Man Spider, now outside, mistakes a woman for Mary Jane and frightens her. <laughs> Yeesh, that'd be a nightmare. I don't blame you, lady. Punisher watches as Man Spider climbs a building and ejects from the battle van, and he blocks Man Spider's acid attack with a shield, but fails to hit his mutant foe. As they move to another rooftop, Punisher uses adhesive to immobilize Man Spider, and as he threatens to kill him, Kravinov intervenes, throwing bolas to disarm Punisher. They grapple, and Mariah arrives, pleading for Man Spider's life. She likens him to her family's victims, leading Punisher to reconsider. They hold Man Spider down, and Mariah administers the cure. As the transformation reverses, Mariah shields Man Spider's identity with Punisher's coat and puts Spider Man's mask on him. Spider Man awakens, initially terrified of Punisher, but Mariah vouches for him as a friend. Spider Man thanks her and sees the new day as a blessing and a chance to be the hero he always was and swings away. Punisher and Kravinov acknowledge Spider-Man's innocence and Morbius' disappearance, and as the sun rises while swinging through the city, Spider-Man watches Mariah and Kravinov leave in a cab. The episode Enter the Green Goblin sees an introduction of one of the most infamously evil characters in the entire series, and even in comic books. That's right, this is the introduction of none other than the Green Goblin. Could you guess from the title? The episode starts on a random night at Oscorp, where Norman Osborn and Dr. Wardell Strom work relentlessly to perfect a new chemical weapon. Norman, driven by the need for a flawless formula, recalls a damning Daily Bugle expose on Oscorp's weapon project, while Anastasia Hardy warns of his responsibility to the board of directors and humanity. Kingpin's video call threatens both Norman and Harry, but all is put to one side as the lab explodes, drawing Spider-Man's attention. Meanwhile, on his way home and stuck in traffic, Harry hears of the explosion on the radio, becoming frantic. Spider-Man arrives and rescues Strom, but encounters obstacles while trying to save Norman. Later, Harry confronts the board of directors, blaming them for Norman's fate delaying his replacement. Kingpin pressures Strom about the chemical weapons whilst a mysterious figure with a maniacal laugh kidnaps an Oscorp board member at a nearby restaurant, all whilst Harry had gone missing. Mary Jane asks Peter to check on Harry, who was distraught and hermited away. Reflecting on his own losses, Spider-Man confronts Jameson's limo attack, leading to a battle with a new adversary, the Green Goblin. Green Goblin's unexpected strength and smarts catch Spider-Man off guard, and so the Goblin escapes with J. Jonah Jameson. The next day, Spider-Man repairs his web shooters and investigates Oscorp, 
Suspecting the goblin's origin, he finds blueprints for goblin's weapons, raising suspicions about Harry. Maybe he is the Green Goblin. Green Goblin then kidnaps Oscorp board members as a collection for an ominous final judgment. Meanwhile, Spider-Man checks out the crime scene and confers with Terry Lee about what she may know, and tells him that he needs to warn other Oscorp board members, including Felicia Hardy's mother, Anastasia. But he's just a second late, as Green Goblin has taken both Felicia and Anastasia, but he drops Felicia knowing Spidey will save her and let him flee with his real prize. But even still, this scoundrel's still not done, as he also targets none other than Kingpin himself and kidnaps him too. Peter returns home to find Mary Jane sitting at his home and asks her if she knows where Harry is yet, but unfortunately she doesn't. However, she does suggest that maybe Harry is involved in the kidnapping of the board members to in some way avenge his father. Peter plants a tracker on MJ in case Harry, or the Green Goblin, comes after her and kidnaps her too. But MJ's curiosity gets the better of her as she snoops around Oscorp's now burnt lab, only to find Harry hunting around in the remains. And of course, as luck would have it, the Green Goblin appears and snatches her away. The Green Goblin's base is oddly underwater, and is where he stashes away all those he's kidnapped, with MJ being his latest victim. He lines them up and tells them that they're all guilty of killing Norman. To order, you are all charged with the crime of hypocrisy. In some way, shape, or form, at the height of his rant, none other than our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man appears, thanks to the tracker he placed on MJ earlier. The two foes fight it out, Green Goblin produces a blinding flash of light from a device in his gloves and breaks free of Spider-Man's grasp, throwing pumpkin bombs at our hero, but they're swiftly dodged. Spider-Man climbs onto the ceiling and crawls onto a glass window. Green Goblin throws another pumpkin bomb and Spider-Man once again dodges it. However, the explosion from the pumpkin bomb causes the window to shatter and the base starts to flood with water. Spider-Man then breaks Mary Jane and the Oscorp board members free of their shackles. Spider-Man then escorts J. Jonah Jameson, Wilson Fisk, Mary Jane, and the other board members to a submarine and tells them to get inside and get to safety. As Mary Jane asks if Spider-Man is coming with them, Spidey answers that he has to capture the Green Goblin. As Spider-Man goes back for the Green Goblin, he sees that the Green Goblin is trapped under debris, so he removes Green Goblin's masks and expects to see Harry Osborn, but is shocked to discover... Norman Osborn?! Norman then reveals that when the Oscorp lab exploded, he breathed in the chemical he was working on, and it caused him to develop a split personality, one of his personalities being his normal self, and the other being the more violent, psychopathic Green Goblin. With the effects of the gas fading, and Norman growing increasingly weak, Spider-Man rescues him, but can't find a way out. That is, until Harry arrives and shows them through an escape hatch. The next day, at a press conference, Oscorp vows to stop manufacturing chemical weapons after the company has hopefully learned its lesson. The episode framed starts from inside a courtroom, where Peter Parker faces treason charges in front of a crowd, including friends, family, and J. Jonah Jameson. His lawyer, Matt Murdock, more on him later, pleads for his innocence, but the judge orders his imprisonment without bail. On his way to prison, a helicopter attack releases knockout gas, and a Spider-Man imposter whisks Peter away. In the helicopter, Peter starts to recall how he got entangled in this mess. Wilson Fisk, a man he once saved, offered him a job at Fisktronics, with Richard Fisk, Wilson's son, heading the new company. Peter accepted the role of a diagnostic analyst, making enough money to quit the Daily Bugle. But on his way home, he's ambushed by gunmen and attack helicopters, but now in his Spider-Man suit, he evades them. Back home, Peter checks on Aunt May's safety, but soon, armed men invade, claiming to be police, led by Agent Susan Choi. She demands a disc from Fisktronics that Peter unknowingly possesses, accusing him of selling classified government secrets. In prison, he meets his lawyer, Matt Murdock, and tells his story. A helicopter takes Peter to an abandoned warehouse, where Richard Fisk reveals his treasonous actions and frames Peter. The fake Spider-Man is, of course, revealed to be the Chameleon. Peter is locked in a chamber with diminishing air supply, until a mysterious man in a devil-like costume, named Daredevil, rescues Peter from the warehouse. Daredevil takes out the guards and saves Peter, 
who learns that Matt Murdock sent him. They escape to the rooftop, where Daredevil demonstrates his extraordinary senses. Daredevil believes Peter is framed and provides refuge in a safe apartment until his innocence can be proven. Daredevil recounts his childhood, how he became blind, and acquired his heightened senses. And yep, you guessed it, Peter's lawyer, Matt Murdock, is Daredevil. At Fisktronics, he faces Daredevil, who thinks Spider-Man is involved in Peter's setup, not knowing his true identity. As they seek evidence, guards set off a bomb, causing debris to fall on them, and Peter retrieves his Spider-Man costume. He returns to Fisktronics to download evidence, but Daredevil confronts him, thinking he's aiding Richard Fisk. They battle guards and evade an explosive catastrophe. The next episode, The Man Without Fear, brings us straight back inside of the burning Fisktronics building, where Daredevil keeps debris from falling on Spidey and himself using his billy club. They crawl out from under the rubble and rush to secure the vital data disk that could clear Peter Parker's name before the fire consumes it. Scaling a wall, more debris falls, striking Daredevil. Spider-Man swiftly moves him to safety and rushes back to retrieve the data disk. At a computer, Spider-Man finds the evidence and saves it. Two guards arrive, firing at Spider-Man, with the hero avoiding their shots. But just then, the warehouse wall collapses due to the fire, and the guards assume Spider-Man's demise and depart. Daredevil arrives promptly and guides Spider-Man to safety, and the two head for the rooftop of Fisktronics where Spider-Man expresses his gratitude to Daredevil for rescuing him. Daredevil clarifies he was saving Peter Parker, cheekily hinting to Spidey that he knows the man under the mask. Daredevil reveals the disc's power to clear Peter's name, so Spider-Man hands it over to him, who ensures he will pass it on to Peter's lawyer, Matt Murdock. Now realizing both he and Spidey fight for the cause of good, Daredevil unveils their true common threat, the philanthropic hidden criminal Wilson Fisk, known as the kingpin in the criminal world. Wait, he's evil? No way. Anywho, just as the two heroes bond, Susan Choi and federal agents surround them, but the super duo quickly escape by leaping off of the roof. At Fisktronics, Terry Lee and the fire department arrive to check the scene after the fire broke out. Terry questions Choi's hasty judgment, suspecting the involvement of the Fisks and someone in a red suit. But Choi dismisses her concerns, thinking she knows it's Spider-Man acting alone. In the lair of Crime Central, Alistair Smythe updates Kingpin on the destruction of secret data and the plan to frame Peter Parker. Richard Fisk arrives, revealing that Peter escaped and that Spider-Man obtained evidence to clear him, potentially incriminating Kingpin. Kingpin blames Smythe for this scheme, but Smythe argues it was necessary to divert federal tension. But Kingpin fears the evidence could lead to his imprisonment. However, when he thinks all hope is lost, he is luckily alerted to Aunt May's hospitalization. This could be a chance to truly manipulate Peter Parker. Peter Parker reaches Matt Murdock's apartment, witnessing news of Aunt May's hospitalization. Matt, arriving at the elevator, assures Peter that Daredevil gave him the evidence needed to clear his name. Peter expresses the need to see his aunt, but Matt cautions against it due to his fugitive status. Despite Peter understanding the risk, he heads to the hospital anyway. At the hospital, Mary Jane and her mother Anna Watson prepare a meal for May. Anna blames Peter for May's condition, but Mary Jane of course defends him. In the hospital, Peter breaks in and finds Mary Jane, taking her into a storage room and asking for her help, pleading with her that he's innocent. MJ knows Peter isn't a criminal, so agrees to help, especially when it's about checking on Aunt May. So the duo set out and Peter takes up a disguise as a doctor to get into May's room. They reach May's room, but Anna's presence triggers Peter's spider sense. Peter assumes it's Anna's anger, as she thinks he's the reason May has fallen ill. However, Anna assists Peter in evading security, but it's too good to be true, as once the trio are outside, Anna reveals her true identity as the Chameleon, gassing Peter and Mary Jane into unconsciousness and whisking them away in a van. Richard Fisk and Susan Choi, having handed the data disc over to Kingpin, are trailed by Terry Lee and the NYPD, who engage in a firefight with them and other guards. Daredevil, breaking through a window, takes down guards and confronts Chameleon. Terry approaches the decompression chamber housing Peter and Mary Jane, but faces Susan Choi's attack, though she overcomes Choi and releases Peter and MJ in the nick of time. Peter changes into a Spider-Man suit and saves Terry from Kingpin's guards. 
Daredevil fights Chameleon, who uses an image deducer to mimic Daredevil, and as Spider-Man arrives to help, he struggles to see who the real Daredevil is, until the actual Daredevil employs his billy club rope to subdue Chameleon. Spider-Man ensures Mary Jane's safety, and Richard Fisk attempts an escape, but is halted by Spider-Man and Daredevil. Although they apprehend Richard Fisk, Chameleon retrieves the data disk and flees in a helicopter, so Spider-Man and Daredevil chase after it. Inside Crime Central, Spider-Man keeps the guards busy while Daredevil goes after Kingpin. Daredevil, after breaking into Kingpin's office, confronts Kingpin, and they clash briefly. However, Kingpin manages to incapacitate Daredevil with an electric taser on his cane. Just as Kingpin is about to finish Daredevil, Spider-Man intervenes, using a web line to hold Kingpin back. Kingpin escapes, and Daredevil pushes a button on Kingpin's belt, revealing that he was Chameleon in disguise. Daredevil concludes that Chameleon likely replaced Kingpin after he escaped via the elevator in his office. Spider-Man questions how Daredevil saw through the ruse, but Daredevil assures him of his respect for privacy, the US Constitution, and the law. A few days later, Richard Fisk and Susan Choi face trial for treason, and Richard refrains from naming accomplices. Kingpin approaches Peter Parker, acting remorseful for his son's actions, which Peter cautiously goes along with, mindful of Kingpin's true identity. That night at Crime Central, Kingpin warns Alistair Smythe about his impending doom due to his failure, and as Smythe exits, Kingpin reflects on his ruthless actions and past, revealing his journey from a lonely and overweight boy to the criminal mastermind he is today. The next day, Matt Murdock visits the Daily Bugle, revealing to J. Jonah Jameson that he was the one who paid for Peter's legal defense. Jameson explains that he wanted to maintain his image and discloses Joseph Robertson's offer for Peter's return to work. On top of the Woolworth building that night, Spider-Man meets Daredevil, who informs him that Matt Murdock is assigned to a special Justice Department mission in Washington, D.C. He entrusts Spider-Man with the task of restraining Kingpin until Murdock can gather legal evidence to imprison him. Spider-Man vows to continue his fight against Kingpin, and they part ways. In the episode Venom Returns, our favorite sinister symbiote is back. The episode starts as the NYPD corners the dangerous and borderline insane criminal Cletus Cassidy in his home. As Terry Lee arrives, Cassidy tosses a grenade out of the window, luckily harming no officers. J3 Communications reports on the raid, while J. Jonah Jameson and Robbie Robertson watch at the Daily Bugle, as Cassidy's capture will make headlines. Robbie says Peter's on his way to the scene to snap some pictures. Terry Lee, with three officers, raids Cassidy's home. Lee gets separated and finds herself alone with the madman Cassidy. Her gun is trained at him, but he quickly knocks it away, throwing her to the ground, about to harm her. When just in the nick of time, Spider-Man arrives. But it's not good news for Spidey, as Cassidy reveals he has a bomb strapped to his waist. Damn, this guy means business. Spider-Man quickly grabs it from Cassidy and swings away. Realizing the blast radius is huge, he throws the bomb into the sky. Terry Lee, now safe, arrests Cassidy and reminds him not to underestimate the heroic Spider-Man. Meanwhile, in Central Park, a couple witnesses a meteor crash. They check it out, poking it with a stick, and are ambushed by two alien symbiotes. Suddenly, back at Cassidy's house, Spider-Man is surrounded by purple smoke, and a telepathic image of this crazy-looking lady, Madame Webb, appears to warn Spider-Man. To defeat this evil, he must trust unlikely allies. A warrior keeps his friends close and his enemies closer. She vanishes, leaving Spider-Man puzzled. And his enemies... Wait! Madame Webb is a powerful cosmic being, an assistant of a much bigger, more powerful entity. But we'll get onto them later. Webb's job is to share moments with Spider-Man that will prepare him for his biggest battle. But what could that mean? At Ravencroft Institute for the Criminally Insane, Eddie Brock talks to Ashley Kafka. Brock admits he wanted to be a hero as he tells her about his time as Venom and his grudge against Spider-Man. She tells Brock that all she wants to do is help him, and as she leaves, Cassidy arrives, placed in a cell next to Brock. Baron Mordo, the master of black magic, meets his master, the great and powerful Dormammu, 
an explicitly evil, extra-dimensional being known to drain life out of entire universes, Mordo informs Dormammu that the symbiote is back on Earth, just as planned, and that the next stage of the plan is to speak to Eddie Brock to get him to bond with the symbiote again. Cassidy overhears the two when Mordo appears to Brock and volunteers himself for bonding, if, and only if, they break him out of the Institute. Brock in the other cell hears this and also offers his help, and the two evil beings lick their lips at the prospect of two symbiotes at their command. They inform the pair of their plan to steal from none other than Stark Enterprises. Which, funnily enough, is exactly where Peter is, along with his classmate Deborah Whitman, where the two are excited about the interdimensional probe on display there. But with such a powerful machine, Peter is worried about the potential danger should this fall into the wrong hands. They meet Dr. Connors and James Rhodes, the head of Stark Enterprises security, pointing out another man, Arden Broom, who is actually an undercover Baron Mordo, here for a sinister plot, listening to the man himself, Tony Stark announcing their new device's capabilities. Meanwhile, Eddie Brock is visited by the woman from the park and the symbiote bonds with him, turning him into Venom. He escapes, causing chaos in the Institute, leaving Cassidy to watch, wanting symbiotic power of his own. Venom goes to Dormammu's lair, and he explains how they brought the symbiote back to Earth, and offers to bring more symbiotes to Earth if Venom steals the interdimensional probe from Stark Enterprises. Back inside Stark Enterprises, they open a portal, but it goes awry when Venom attacks, overpowering security. Spider-Man arrives, and a fierce battle breaks out where even War Machine, aka James Rhodes, intervenes. Venom's stronger than before, and nearly gets the better of Spider-Man. But sudden sonic noises weaken the massive menace, when just then, another symbiote arrives, blood red and filled with fury, referring to himself as Carnage. He rips off the sonic device and reveals himself to be Cletus Cassidy, and threatens to kill Spider-Man. These Venom-centric episodes are great, but really, all you've got to take away from this one is the dilation accelerator. If you want to hear how the tales of Carnage and Venom end, I implore you to go check out the following episode, Carnage, on your own. You won't be disappointed. In Limbo, the Time Dilation Accelerator creates portals uncontrollably and lands in Fort Tryon Park. Founded by Linny Luntz, who wants to pawn it, Peter Parker and MJ walk through the park, where she worries about the dangers of attracting supervillains' attention, but Peter reassures her, even briefly thinking about quitting being the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, but realizes he can't. Lenny pawns the accelerator, activating it, creating a portal and causing unrelenting chaos. Spider-Man jumps into action and saves Lenny, trying to stop the portal. But if that wasn't bad enough, Hobgoblin attacks. Hobgoblin is an offshoot of the Green Goblin, by the way. The weaponry is the same, but the man behind the mask is different. This isn't Norman Osborn, it's Jason Mackendale, a petty thief. He steals the accelerator and flies away, but Spider-Man clings to his glider, struggling to hold on, before he falls into the river. Hobgoblin robs a bank later, then realizes the accelerator's power is dwindling, so he meets a spy in Kingpin's organization, seeking a power pack to fuel his devious device. Hobgoblin opens a portal to Kingpin's office, seeking a power pack and offering a proposition to him. Give him a pack, and together they can forever change the theft business, wanting to attack the Federal Reserve of Gold. He tells Kingpin to meet him here at midnight if he wants to be a part of the sinister scheme. He leaves, leaving Kingpin deep in thought on how such a powerful weapon has fallen into the hands of a lowlife. He needs to know who is the man behind the mask, and if he knew that, he may be able to take the upper hand. And more importantly, the time dilation device. Kingpin knows a man who may be able to help him, the man who manufactures Hobgoblin's weapons, and formerly his own, Norman Osborn. Whilst at Felicia Hardy and Jason Phillips' engagement party, Peter's spider senses go off after an argument with his former friend, Harry Osborn, who accuses him of stealing Mary Jane off of him. In an earlier episode, MJ decided her heart lies with Peter, especially after finding out he's Spider-Man. Although hard-hitting, the result of his senses firing isn't because of Harry, but the appearance of Wilson Fisk. Peter then eavesdrops on Norman and Fisk, learning they'll meet at Oscorp. 
Norman's Green Goblin persona takes control, planning to help Fisk by finding Hobgoblin's true identity. Green Goblin, Hobgoblin, and Spider-Man clash as they chase each other through portals. Spider-Man follows and battles Green Goblin, who throws a bomb, sending Spider-Man spiraling into the Hudson. Whilst in Jason's study, Felicia discovers the Hobgoblin costume and realizes Jason's hidden identity as Hobgoblin, as he isn't Jason Phillips, but Jason Mackendale. Green Goblin is hot on his tail and subdues Jason, and right on cue, Spider-Man returns, rescuing Felicia. But the Green Goblin has already secured the time dilation device. He plans to eliminate Norman's enemies, but as Spidey arrives, Green Goblin opens a portal and vanishes. Jason is arrested, and Felicia questions her choices as the police take Jason away. Green Goblin manages to teleport back to Oscorp. He modifies and charges the time dilation device with one thing in mind, getting revenge on Spider-Man. The next episode is titled Turning Point and starts with Spider-Man telling Madame Webb he wants to end their partnership because he has everything he wants now. She warns that he'll need her wisdom and to not count his chickens before they hatch as she predicts a looming threat, a two-headed monster rising from the netherworld. At Oscorp, Norman Osborn creates a miniaturized time dilation accelerator for Green Goblin, and the two sides of Norman argue over its stability. Green Goblin lures Spider-Man into a fight by attacking an armored truck, and our webbed wonder fights back, but can't seem to find Green Goblin. His spider sense acts up, and he worries about his mutation disease that we saw earlier in the show. Green Goblin secretly observes Spider-Man unmasking in an alley, Shocked that his enemy is just a young boy named Peter Parker, a friend of his son. Back with MJ, Peter arrives at a diner and to talk. Peter still feels guilty over Harry. He suggests not attending Harry's party, but MJ insists they should go to keep the peace. At the party, Harry blames Peter for attending on his father's insistence, and Norman pretends to be friendly but tightens his grip on Peter's hand, raising suspicions that he knows Peter's secret. During dinner, Norman questions Peter's pictures of Spider-Man, hinting further he may know the man behind the Spider-Mask. Peter creates a diversion by filling the mansion with smoke and appears as Spider-Man to fight Green Goblin. Norman reveals that he intends to expose Peter, so he leaves to protect his secret identity. Back home, Spider-Man's Spider-Sense warns of a threat, and he believes Norman must know his identity. The Green Goblin kidnaps Mary Jane to lure Peter further, and of course, it works. Spider-Man tries to save her, but he loses track of MJ, believing she fell into the Hudson River. Green Goblin escapes once again with the time dilation accelerator, and Spider-Man now thinks his beloved Mary Jane is dead and pursues Green Goblin for revenge. They fight on the George Washington Bridge, where Mary Jane falls into a portal created by the damaged accelerator. Desperate to save her, Spider-Man tries to rescue Green Goblin from the unstable portal. He saves Green Goblin, and the portal closes, leaving both Mary Jane and Green Goblin in limbo. Madame Webb appears, but Spider-Man can't save Mary Jane. He becomes furious and rejects her help, leaving him with the loss of Mary Jane and the crumbling of his perfect life. In limbo, Mary Jane calls for help, but there's no one around to hear her. Somebody, please, help me! Help! Yeesh, that's... Kinda dark, actually. The episode The Black Cat begins with Spider-Man swinging where else but through New York, where he reflects on not preventing Felicia Hardy's kidnapping and Anastasia Hardy's disappearance from an earlier episode. Meanwhile, a mysterious woman in a cat suit robs a jewelry store, setting off alarms to attract Spider-Man. She introduces herself as Black Cat. She looks a bit familiar, doesn't she? She knocks Spider-Man out with sleeping gas and kisses him. S.H.I.E.L.D. agents hear about Spider-Man and suspect that he's after the Super Soldier Serum formula, and at Crime Central, Kingpin and John Hardesky, the father of Felicia Hardy, who's known as the Cat, wait for their newest evil acquaintance to arrive, the Black Cat. She returns with stolen diamonds and reveals Landon improved the serum, which allows Black Cat to transform between her natural frame and a muscular body, as she has been given the Super Soldier Serum. Black Cat reveals herself as... Have you got it yet? Yep, that's right! Felicia Hardy. At the Daily Bugle, Peter Parker informs Robbie Robertson about Black Cat, and then visits Anastasia Hardy, and gives her a spider tracer for contacting him. 
Hardesky helps Felicia escape, and she returns home. Felicia wants to save her father, and seeks Spider-Man's help. So, as Black Cat, Felicia contacts Spider-Man using the Spider Tracer, and they unite to save her father. They encounter S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and go on a chase through New York. Spider-Man and Black Cat subdue the agents, while at Crime Central, Hardesky tries to escape, but Kingpin realizes it's a distraction for Felicia. Hardesky erases the serum formula from Landon's computers, and Black Cat and an imposter board Kingpin's stealth ship. The imposter is revealed to be Spider-Man. They fight Kingpin's men, whilst out of nowhere, Dr. Octopus appears and captures Black Cat. Agent X and S.H.I.E.L.D. agents attack the stealth ship. John says goodbye to Felicia and Anastasia, and is picked up by S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. He worries about the serum falling into the wrong hands. Spider-Man helps and uses J. Jonah Jameson's communications badge to alert S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. As Spider-Man swings away, he contemplates his connection with Black Cat amidst the chaos. The next episode, The Awakening, begins as Spider-Man grapples with mixed emotions. Loneliness, sadness, and guilt over Mary Jane's loss. His growing feelings for Black Cat distract him. Black Cat appears and surprises Spider-Man, playfully teasing him. He swings away, wondering why his spider sense didn't trigger, even if it was all in good fun. He follows Black Cat, and they both enjoy the chase. Literally, and, well... Yeah, you get me. On an island near New York, Deborah Whitman and her team discover Michael Morbius in his bat form. Memories of her past with Morbius resurface. She recalls confessing her love for him, only to hear his heart belonged to Felicia. Flash Thompson protests their rescue due to a past attack by Morbius. They transport Morbius back to New York. Peter asks Felicia to cover his class while he attends Kurt Connors' press conference. Connors reveals that Morbius has been found, causing panic. Connors plans to reverse engineer Neogenics to cure Morbius, but people walk out on him, dismissing his efforts. Felicia, packing for a trip, learns of Morbius's discovery, and so becomes her black cat persona and seeks help. Kurt, Deborah, and Clay attempt to cure Morbius, but the experiment fails, all while Kingpin and Herbert Landon secretly watch and discuss their plan to make themselves immortal using Morbius's DNA. Spider-Man visits Dr. Connors to check on Morbius's status, and Black Cat reaches out to Blade for help with Morbius. Landon and Shocker break in, inadvertently awakening Morbius and escaping, leading Spider-Man and Black Cat to chase them. Morbius almost attacks Innocence, but is halted by Black Cat. She reminds him of their past and offers help. Morbius agrees to meet her in a clock tower. Black Cat finds the courage to help Morbius using a solar weapon. However, Landon and Shocker interfere, capturing Morbius once more. Spider-Man arrives on the scene and Morbius manages to escape. They track him to a mortuary, where Kingpin's hidden laboratory holds him. Morbius attacks Kingpin, but Kingpin evades and locks him away, but it doesn't stop him from draining Landon. Black Cat hesitates to use the solar weapon on Morbius, allowing him to escape while Spider-Man comforts her, still unaware that Black Cat is actually Felicia Hardy. Following straight on into the next episode, titled The Vampire Queen, Felicia Hardy is in deep thought with a tough decision. She's torn between betraying Spider-Man or assisting in Michael Morbius' death. Memories flash through her mind, each one not making the decision any easier. But eventually, she dons her black cat costume, uses her grapple hook, and swings away from her balcony. Meanwhile, Spider-Man swings past Felicia's apartment just moments too late, pondering if he'll ever see Black Cat again. He realizes he needs help against Morbius since vampire hunting isn't his expertise. Over in Transylvania, Blade, a vampire hunter, confronts Miriam, a vampire, near a village close to her castle. Their battle commences, but Miriam escapes, leaving Blade with her locket. Back in New York, Black Cat hopes that Morbius is still alive, and Spider-Man notices Morbius' lack of attacks, deducing that he's starving due to a lack of plasma. In another part of the city, Morbius wrestles with his hunger, refusing to feed on humans when Miriam appears, seeking Morbius' knowledge of the Neogenic Recombinator. Reluctantly, he reveals the crucial information, and at Empire State University's lab, Miriam compels Deborah Whitman to reveal the Recombinator's location. Kingpin later arrives at the lab, noticing the Neogenic Recombinator is missing, 
and Spider-Man arrives at the ESU. Discovering Deborah and Flash have been taken away in an ambulance, suspecting it's Morbius who feasted on his friends. Spider-Man and Black Cat seek Whistler's help, another vampire hunter, to secure a non-lethal weapon to stop Morbius. Terry Lee reveals that Whistler has the equipment they need, and together, Spider-Man, Black Cat, Terry Lee, and Whistler set out to track Morbius throughout the city. During this pursuit, Black Cat's concerns for Morbius intensify, drawing from her past experiences with someone inflicted by vampirism. Their path leads them to the dungeon, where they discover important instructions for the Neogenic Recombinator. However, they encounter an unexpected threat when Miriam attacks, forcing Blade to step in. Miriam's mysterious connection to Blade leaves everyone in shock. Black Cat rushes to Morbius' aid, and together they thwart Miriam, who manages to escape with the Recombinator. Back at their headquarters, Morbius receives a life-saving serum injection from Whistler. Terry Lee voices her doubts about Blade's allegiance, and Blade departs to find Miriam. On the following day, Peter Parker replaces his damaged Spider-Man mask, unaware that a piece of the old one is hanging over the edge of his dresser drawer. He dons a new mask, as Harry Osborn grows suspicious of his secret identity. Back at their headquarters, Whistler reassures Black Cat about Morbius' recovery. She expresses her readiness to stand by him and offer support. Blade embarks on a mission to confront Miriam at the dungeon. Miriam unveils her terrifying plan to use the Recombinator to transform everyone into vampires. When Spider-Man and the others intervene, an accidental activation of the Recombinator turns some patrons into vampires. Blade rescues his mother, and they depart. Spider-Man, Black Cat, and their team take on the newly turned vampires. Spider-Man, Black Cat, Morbius, and Blade rush to the rooftop, preventing Miriam from using the Recombinator on Blade. They manage to divert her plans, causing the Recombinator to break and turning the vampires back into humans. Miriam flees. Blade and the others agree to help her. Black Cat informs Spider-Man of her intention to pursue Miriam. He offers to join her, but she decides to go alone, realizing the responsibility to protect New York City rests on his shoulders. As Black Cat and Morbius set out with Blade to track down Miriam, Spider-Man and Terry Lee have a candid conversation about their complicated relationships. Terry responds to a call and leaves Spider-Man to reflect on his current challenges. With a heavy heart, Spider-Man swings away, harboring hope for better times ahead, despite the recent losses he's endured. In the episode titled The Wedding, we get to see stuff dreams are made of, as Peter and Mary Jane are about to get married. But you're sat there thinking, wait, wasn't she in limbo lost forever? Doesn't Peter now have eyes for Black Cat? Well, in an earlier episode, Mary Jane was saved by Spider-Man. Or was she? Without giving anything away as we head towards the final stretch of episodes, don't set your hopes too high, as maybe this MJ isn't our MJ. The episode starts with Aunt May at the bank, handing Peter her and Uncle Ben's wedding rings for his upcoming marriage to MJ. When the Scorpion suddenly arrives, causing chaos as he steals money from the bank. To stop him, Peter swiftly breaks out his Spidey costume, but Scorpion takes the rings and Aunt May hostage, prompting a chase through the city which results in Scorpion fleeing when his suit gets wet. Meanwhile, at the Ravencroft Institute, Harry Osborn undergoes therapy with Dr. Kafka. Also in an earlier episode, he tried to follow in his father's footsteps and become the Green Goblin. He shares delusions about his father as the Green Goblin and Peter Parker as Spider-Man. Mary Jane and Liz reveal the news of her impending marriage to Peter, causing Harry emotional turmoil. After their departure, haunted by his father's apparitions, and the thought of MJ marrying Peter, Harry escapes Ravencroft and re-embraces the Green Goblin persona. Peter visits Wilson Fisk, who offers to cover the wedding expenses, stating that not only would he like to help Peter, but it's also fantastic publicity for his new newspaper, The Daily Beacon. Peter takes up Fisk on his offer, but Jameson is furious at Peter for joining a rival paper, unaware of Fisk's involvement, or that he is only doing it for a one-off payment towards a wedding. When he finds out, Jameson offers to fund Peter's wedding himself. At Oscorp, 
Harry strikes a deal with Alistair Smythe to disrupt Peter and Mary Jane's wedding using robotic assistance. The arrangement also involves a partnership with Oscorp related to Silvermane. The Green Goblin, Scorpion, and Goblin Robo-Warriors head towards the church. The moment arrives, with Robbie as Peter's best man. Various guests are in attendance, including Felicia Hardy, returned from Europe as Black Cat, Flash Thompson, Deborah Whitman, Jameson, and Fisk, both competing as wedding hosts. The Green Goblin, Scorpion, and Robots crash the ceremony, terrifying the guests, but Fisk dispatches the last Mega Slayer created by Smythe to combat the villains. Spider-Man and Black Cat confront Scorpion and the robots, and inside the church, Harry threatens to blow it up, revealing himself as the Green Goblin. Marry me now, MJ, or I'll blast us all to smithereen! Wanting to forcibly marry Mary Jane, but Liz intervenes, changing his mind, letting him know that just because he doesn't have MJ doesn't mean he can't have anyone, as she confesses her love for him. But for that to happen, he has to give up the act as the Green Goblin, as she takes him back to Ravencroft, and finally, Peter and MJ get married. After the ceremony, Peter and Mary Jane drive away in a Daily Bugle van with a Just Married sign. Season 5, Episode 12. The episode begins with Spider-Man being plunged into a dystopian alternate reality where New York City has been devastated by a war between two factions of supervillains the Hobgoblin and the Green Goblin on one side, and Spider Carnage on the other. Spider Carnage is a twisted version of Spider-Man who has been bonded with the Carnage symbiote, a parasitic alien that amplifies his aggression and insanity. Spider Carnage plans to use a doomsday device that can destroy all reality, and only Spider-Man can stop him. In the heat of the battle, Spidey is summoned and transported by Madame Webb. She tells him that he has been chosen by the Beyonder, a powerful cosmic entity who can manipulate reality, to participate in a test of his worthiness, which is why he's been put into the dystopian pit of hate. Spider-Man soon meets several alternate versions of himself, who have been gathered by Madame Webb to form a team. They include a six-armed Spider-Man who has mutated into a man-spider, a Spider-Man with Dr. Octopus's mechanical arms, an armored Spider-Man who wears a high-tech suit, a Scarlet Spider who is a clone of Peter Parker created by Professor Miles Warren, and a Spider-Man actor who plays the role of Spider-Man in a TV show. If you thought that was meta, just wait for the next episode. Each of them has their own personality and they quickly clash, but together in battle, they're fierce. They infiltrate the Kingpin's headquarters, where Spider-Carnage is hiding. However, they are confronted by the Hobgoblin and the Green Goblin, who engage them in a fierce battle once more. But in a catastrophic turn of events, Man-Spider begins attacking his fellow Spider-Men, and Spider-Carnage activates the Doomsday device and prepares to unleash it on the world. Following straight on from that big cliffhanger, Man-Spider and several alternate versions of himself continue to battle and confront Spider-Carnage in his home dimension. His powerful bomb that will annihilate everything is at the ready, and Spider-Man tries to reason with him. But Spider-Carnage is too consumed by hatred and madness. He escapes through the portal, leaving behind his device that will destroy the entire world. But our Spider-Man follows him to another dimension, where Spider-Man is a billionaire and the owner of the Peter Parker Science Foundation. In this world, Spider-Man is engaged to Gwen Stacy, who is alive and well, and he also has found Mary Jane Watson, who had disappeared in his own dimension. As it turns out, the MJ he married was a defective clone. See, I said don't get your hopes up. I mean, it hurts me though too. Spider-Man is overjoyed to see them, but he also realizes that he has to stop Spider-Carnage from ruining this perfect world. He soon discovers that Spider-Carnage has allied himself with the kingpin of this dimension, who is also his... Uncle? Kingpin has provided him with resources and technology to build his bomb, wanting to not only take over the Peter Parker of this dimension, but every dimension, creating a vast network of wealth through the fabric of space. Peter escapes and follows Spider Carnage, who's taken Gwen Stacy as a hostage on a rooftop, as he begins building the bomb to destroy yet another world. Peter arrives and tries to appeal to his humanity, reminding him of Uncle Ben's death and how it taught him responsibility. Spider Carnage is momentarily touched, 
but then he snaps out of it and attacks Spider-Man. He activates the bomb and prepares to open the portal. However, before he can do so, Uncle Ben appears. In this dimension, he's still alive and has been alerted by Aunt May, who had seen the news report of the spider robot. Uncle Ben recognizes Peter as his nephew and calls out to him. Spider Carnage is shocked and confused by this as he had killed Uncle Ben in his own dimension. He approaches him and tells him that he loves him and that he can still choose to do good. He hugs him and asks him to give up his evil plan. Spider Carnage is moved by Uncle Ben's words and decides to end his own misery, throwing himself into the portal with the bomb, sacrificing himself to save all of reality. The portal closes and the bomb explodes in a void between dimensions. The crisis is averted and reality is restored. Spider-Man thanks Uncle Ben for saving the day and tells him that he loves him too, even if it's not really his uncle. He then bids farewell to the other Spider-Men, who return to their own dimensions with Madame Web and the Beyonder. But before leaving, Madame Web tells Spider-Man that she has one more surprise for him. She takes him to a dimension where he meets Stan Lee, the creator of Spider-Man. Stan is thrilled to meet his creation, and they swing around the city together, having a blast. Stan Lee tells Spider-Man that he is so proud of him, and that he has inspired millions of people with his heroism. Spider-Man thanks Stan Lee for giving him life, and making him who he is. They hug, and they say goodbye, as Madame Web takes Spider-Man back to his own dimension. <laughs> now that's what I call meta. And that meta madness is how the series finishes. Sadly, Peter never did fully rescue MJ, but he did manage to save his world, and every other world in the known universe, and other universes. You get the idea. Well, I hope you've enjoyed swinging through five seasons of Spider-Man Madness as much as I have. Thank you all so much for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, share with your friends, all that good stuff. And let us know down below what show you'd like to see next. See you all next time!